There's a British biochemist named Sheldrake. He has a rather interesting theory. I... God damn it! Ah, what the hell? A bed? I fell pretty far. That really hurt. Damn, my eyesight's kind of blurry. Must have hit my head. No, wait. That's not it. An earthquake! But it, it's shaking too fast for that. Uh, anyway... Where... am I? Wait, it... it stopped? What's that sound? That's... five. What's this five mean? Ah, it won't open. Oh, what's up with my face? I look like a zombie. Man, what the hell happened to me? How did I end up here? I left work, headed back to my apartment, and... And... I'm back! Not like anyone will respond. Ugh, man, work was rough today. Huh? A breeze? Huh, that, that's weird. Did I leave that open? Hmm, everything looks okay. I must have forgotten to close it. I... I can't... Consider this a privilege. You have been chosen. You are going to participate in the game. The memory game. It is a game where you will put your life on the line. That's right. That guy with the gas mask. That son of a bitch must have taken me here. When I get my hands on him... Well, I, I guess there's no way to know if that was a man or not. Just who was that? They said, you have been chosen. What the hell is going on? Why me? You are going to participate in the game. The memory game. It is a game where you will put your life on the line. The nonary game? Huh. What the hell is a nonary game? God, God damn it! Huh. This is... Hold on. Uh... Am I on a ship? I can't see anything. If only it wasn't so dark outside. Huh? What the? Oh, you gotta be kidding me. What? What the hell is going on here?
What the hell? God damn it! Next. What? People. A lot of people. Um. Uh. Um. Yeah. Uh. I guess it's another one of us now. Yeah, a, a, a dancer. No, I'm not. You better get moving. Oh, uh, well, okay then. S silver hair? Huh? <laughs> One of us, huh? We're, what? Nothing. Going up won't do you any good. There are two doors, but neither of them will open. Wait, hold on. The, the doors won't open? That's nine of us, then. All of the cards are in hand. Wait! They're gone. Just what is going on? There's an old man like a lion, a girl with pink hair, and a prince, and I have no idea what they're talking about. Huh? Did you hear him? Uh -huh. The doors on A deck are no good. We gotta check the doors on B deck. Got it? Now go! Oh. Huh? Yeah! Watch out! Yeah. Oh my gosh! Is that you, Jumpy? Uh, Akane.
What? What's that voice? I am This is... That guy in the gas mask! Hey, asshole! What the hell is this? Come on out here. I want to get a look at you. What do you mean to do to us? Nonary game. What the hell's that? What is he talking about? Hey, there's something in my pocket. Check this out. Hey, I, I got one too. Then it would seem Zero has seen fit to grace us each with a letter. Would you mind terribly reading it to us, young man? On this ship, you will find a handful of doors emblazoned with numbers. We will call them the numbered doors. The doors in front of you are a pair of the same. The key to opening these numbered doors are the numbered bracelets that each of you possess. Should you total the numbers on your numbered bracelets and find that the digital root of that number is equal to the number of that door, the door will open. Only those who have opened the door may pass through. There are, however, limits. Only three to five people can pass through one numbered door. All those who enter must leave, and all who enter must contribute. So this thing on my arm is a bracelet. The purpose of the game is simple. Leave this ship alive. It is hidden, but an exit can be found. Seek a way out. Seek a door that carries a nine. I've seen this picture before. Where? In a book. There's a British biochemist named Sheldrake. He has a rather interesting theory. I saw this picture in his book. I... What's this interesting theory? Morphogenetic fields, which relies on the theory of morphic resonance. With this, just listening to you talk about it is giving me a headache. 
it's not a difficult concept to grasp. In essence, he states that the shape of living organisms and their behavioral patterns are transmitted through a field not visible to the eye. Uh, what part of that isn't difficult, exactly? All right, how about this? Theory of the telepathic mechanism. Telepathy? Yes, telepathy. Well, perhaps not exactly telepathy, but it's close enough for a simple approximation. <laughs> are you serious? Telepathy? Who do you think we are? Kids from the 70s? I can't believe someone would actually do serious research on something like that. Yes, I agree. I read the book, but I can hardly say I understood it. I'm in no position to defend or condemn anything it said. It was probably just someone latching onto a statistical outlier from some study and turning it into a ridiculous theory. There's no scientific merit to any of it, I'm sure. But even so, I... Um... <laughs> anyway, I saw a picture like that one in his book. Hey, what do you think this picture looks like? What do you mean? Isn't it just like abstract or something like that? It's just black and white scribbles. There's no meaning there. That's it. What about you, Junpei? Does it look like anything to you? Hmm, I, I guess it looks like... Maybe, uh, a dog. No, see, you got the, you got the head here, and then these are the front paws, and then these are the back paws. See? Oh, I see it. I guess you've got a point. How did you know? You're right. I didn't think you would have been able to guess that. So? Now we know what it's a picture of, but I, I don't see how that helps us. A TV show from Great Britain did an experiment once. They took two similar pictures. Both of them were difficult to identify, initially. But once you figured out the answer, you couldn't see it as anything else. These two pictures. The first was a woman wearing a hat. The other one, well, to make it easier, Let's just say it was this picture of a dog. So, their experiment. First, they sent the picture to other parts of the world, outside the reach of British airwaves. To Ireland, the US, Africa, Europe, etc. Then, in each country, they gathered a number of test subjects, roughly a thousand people. They were shown the two pictures and asked, what does this picture look like to you? The results weren't really interesting on their own. 9.2% of the people saw the lady in the lady picture. 3.9% saw the dog in the dog picture. Then, two days later, they aired a new program on their show. During the 30-minute show, they broadcast the dog picture and its solution. The audience was estimated to be 200,000 people. After the broadcast, it was a safe bet that the number of people who knew the solution to the dog picture was at least that many.
after another two days passed, they gathered more research subjects from areas outside the reach of British TV and radio. This time, they only found a sample of roughly 850 people. Naturally, none of them had participated in the first test. They were, however, given the same tests and the same two pictures. The results were startling. 10% of the people saw the lady in the lady picture. The previous test sat at a 9.2% success rate. Not much of a change, statistically. The dog picture, however, produced a very different result. The percentage of people able to successfully find the dog, it went from 3.9% to 6.8%, a very significant increase. So do you understand? Do you realize the significance of this experiment? There was no way the second group could have seen the picture. They lived far away from Britain and couldn't have seen it. But even so, it was only the success rate for the dog picture that went up. Why? How did that happen? What does it mean? Oh, wait, does this have something to do with that field or whatever it was that you were talking about earlier? a field not visible to the eye. So, if more people know the answer, then that information will pass through the field. Hmm. Huh. Hmm. Hmm. Psych! <laughs> I was just kidding. You really shouldn't take me seriously. Well, I mean, the things I just told you about are true. They really did happen. But the results of that experiment really aren't anything to go by. They could have easily falsified them. In the end, I'm sure they were just in it for the ratings. They are a TV station after all. <laughs> Man, I gotta admit, you had me there for a minute. I, uh, really thought you were serious. <laughs> of course not. Like I told you before, I'm sure it's all just pseudoscience. Uh, oh, okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, enough nonsense. We've got the key. Let's get out of here. Word. Huh. A field not visible to the naked eye. Morphogenetic field. Water's a liquid between 32 degrees and 212 degrees. So why isn't that the case for carbon dioxide? There's a kind of ice that doesn't turn into liquid when it goes above 32 degrees. Hmm? Huh? I heard about it. Its melting point is 96 degrees. Ice with a melting point of 96 degrees? You mean there's water that freezes at 96 degrees? Yeah, well... You could also look at it as ice that won't melt until it's 96 degrees. So what's this ice with a melting point of 96 degrees called? I heard it's called Ice 9. Ice 9? Originally, Ice 9 was a made-up substance invented by a science fiction author. But recently, scientists have discovered that such a substance actually exists. Wait, hold up. So is this thing called Ice-9, or is it water? Like I said, if the ice is over 96 degrees, it'll be liquid. If it's under that, 
it'll solidify. So, you could think of it as a polymorph of H2O. Here, think of it like diamonds and graphite. They're both made of carbon, right? But depending on the structure of the crystallization, oh, the hardness and structure are completely different. So you're saying normal water and this Ice-9 are like that? Yep. Have you heard the story about the crystallization of glycerin? For 150 years after the discovery of glycerin, people cooled it, warmed it. They did all sorts of things to it. But whatever they did, it never crystallized. However, one day in 1920, some glycerin on its way to England by ship was discovered to have crystallized during the trip. Scientists around the world wanted to research this new, crystallized form of glycerin and asked for seeds. Oh, a seed is a sample of the original crystallized substance. With a seed crystal, further crystallization of glycerin would be easy. However, something very strange happened. Not only did the glycerin encouraged by seed crystals begin to crystallize, even the samples nearby did, even though they were tightly sealed. And it didn't end there. After that day, it doesn't matter where in the world it is. All glycerin crystallizes naturally when cooled to less than 64 degrees. Before that day, no matter how glycerin was cooled, it refused to crystallize. But once the crystallization had begun, it was almost like, how do I put it? It was almost like all the glycerin in the world was communicating. Communicating in some way that we can't sense. And now it's happening everywhere. Wow, that's, that's pretty interesting. But, uh... What does that have to do with Ice-9? What she's saying is that it's a lot like Ice-9. What happened, I mean. A lot like? Oh, that would be bad. If water everywhere started freezing at 96 degrees... Man... It'd be the end of the world. Hmm? Hey, Seven, what's up? Oh, well... Is... is that a medicine bottle? I got curious about it. Here! Ethylene diamine tartrate? Yeah, that's right. It's EDT. What kind of medicine is that? It's not medicine. I think it's an industrial strength detergent. Why would they have something like that here? Well, probably to clean stuff up. Clean what up? Fuck if I know. Still, it looks like it's cleaned my brain up. You remember something? Yeah. Well, I remember a story about EDT. Happened about 50 years ago. There was this factory somewhere in America making big old EDT crystals. <laughs> they were making it to sell as an industrial strength cleaner, like I told you before. But... A year after the factory started up, something strange started happening with the crystals they were building. Water molecules started attaching themselves to the EDT crystals. This made them into a sort of mutation of the original crystals, called a hydrate. Well, 
Once the crystals turn into a hydrate, though, it's useless as a cleaner. The factory had to just dump the crystals. As a hydrate, they were useless. But it didn't end there. After that day, the same thing started happening in EDT factories everywhere. Even ones nowhere near that first American factory. They'd been making crystals the same way, with the same materials and the same equipment and environment. But now, all of a sudden, every single crystal they formed turned into a hydrate. In fact, ever since that day, no factory anywhere has been able to make a pure EDT crystal. Even in EDT research done years before, they'd never gotten a hydrate. But after it happened at the first factory, it just... spread. It was like... man, how do you say it? Like the molecules were communicating with one another. Transmitting information in a way humans couldn't perceive. This phenomena spread throughout the world, right? Yeah, that's... That's it exactly. But how did you know? I heard another story, uh, kind of like that one. When? In the freezer. What? The freezer? Yeah, June told me. Hmm. Ice that doesn't melt at room temperature, huh? That sounds familiar? Yeah, hold up. I, I feel like I can remember something. It's right there. Do you? Do you know about Ice Nine? Ice Nine? Ice Nine. Ice Nine. Ice, ice, ice. That's it, I remember now. That woman, she's on this boat. That woman? Alice! Who's Alice? Come on, the woman who won't melt at room temperature. Huh? You know how the Titanic sank on April 15th, 1912, right? Yeah, more than 1,500 people died. Worst maritime accident in history. What about it? Did you hear about the boat that was sent to collect the dead bodies? Uh, I think that was the RMS Carpathia, right? It was a cruise liner, just like the Titanic. No, that was the ship that picked up the survivors. The ship that collected the dead bodies was the C.S. McKay Bennett. The McKay Bennett showed up on April 17th, two days after the accident. It set out from Halifax, a port in Canada, and recovered 306 bodies. The Atlantic that far north was really cold. It would have to be for there to be icebergs and stuff. Anyway, the bodies they pulled out of the water were frozen solid. This isn't a very nice story. So, what happened next? Well, they say the McKay Bennett recovered something more than just dead bodies. There were various bits of stuff floating around in the water. Things the drowned had carried with them, or stuff that dislodged as the ship sank. One of the things they found was a coffin. A coffin? Yeah, a wooden one. The craftsman who made it must have been pretty skilled. It wasn't just a wooden coffin. It was all wood, no nails, no reinforcements, no gaps in the wood anywhere. The thing was airtight. The crew got pretty curious about what might be inside it and opened it up. 
I had to get a wedge and hammer it open if so well made it. Inside. They found a woman. Or, I guess you should say, they found the dead body of a woman. Her hair was thick and black, and her skin rich brown with no blemishes or signs of decomposition. They say that she looked gorgeous, like a goddess. She was obviously dead, but everyone who looked at her said she just looked like she was sleeping. Her skin was so lifelike, she looked like she might wake up any minute. And she didn't, though. Like the rest of the bodies they found, she was frozen solid. Eventually, the McKay Bennett finished searching and returned to Halifax. The 306 bodies were unloaded and taken ashore. However, it was warm enough that they began to thaw. They say that the stink was horrible. But there was one body that didn't thaw. And that was... The girl in the coffin. That's right. Everybody thought for sure that she'd melt and start to rot like the rest of them eventually. Weeks passed and nothing happened. And a month passed, and another. And it was summer, and she was still frozen solid. After a while, people started to say she was some sort of miracle. Rumors about her started to spread. People came to visit Halifax from all over. After a while, people started to call her All Ice. Alice. Of course, those rumors didn't last long. Why? Well, she up and disappeared. One day Alice was there, the next day she wasn't. They say someone snuck into where they were keeping her and stole the body. With the body gone, the rumors followed pretty quickly. After a while, no one remembered her. You might be able to find something about her if you could find a newspaper from back then, but that's about it. Wait. You just said that she was on this boat. Yeah, I did. Alice has got to be somewhere on this ship. Now why the hell would you say something like that? Because I know. And just what is it you know? What happened to Alice after she was stolen? Alright, tell me. What happened to Alice? Well, around that time, the word was that there was a special black market in New York. All millionaires from all over the world. I've heard that Alice went up for auction there. The person who won the auction was... Lord Dashiell Gordain. You've heard that name before, right? Lord Gordain. Isn't he the guy who bought the Gigantic? The Titanic sister ship? Yeah, that's him. Although I guess he hadn't done that yet. What do you mean? Gordain bought Alice in 1912. Four years later, in 1916, he bought the Gigantic. And he hid Alice somewhere on the Gigantic. But nobody knows where. He died in 1931, and apparently he died without ever telling anyone where Alice was hidden. However... However... what? Well, he did have one close friend who asked him... Where is...
is Alice. And he said, Alice sleeps in a small chamber past the forest of knowledge beneath the navel of the gigantic. Huh? Why were you thinking about futility? Well, it has something to do with the Titanic. The Titanic? Yep. Have you ever heard the story that the sinking of the Titanic was predicted? No, I, I haven't. What is it? In 1892, 14 years before the Titanic sank, a novel was published. It was called Futility. It was written by an American novelist named Morgan Robertson. The story was about a big cruise ship colliding with an iceberg and sinking. Of course, if that was the only similarity, there wouldn't be any reason to mention it. It wasn't, though. The name of the ship, its nationality, course, departure time, size, displacement, maximum speed, number of passengers and crew, the number of lifeboats, even the location of the accident itself, and the cause, and the location of the damage. Everything matches the Titanic almost exactly. It was almost as if he'd seen the whole thing happen. But this book was written 14 years before the Titanic sank. Hmm. But that's not all. It wasn't just futility that predicted the sinking of the Titanic. There were two other similar stories written by a man named William Thomas Stead. Both of them before the accident. One in 1886 and one in 1892. Stead wrote two stories that had striking similarities to the Titanic disaster. In one, two ships collided. Many of the passengers died because there weren't enough lifeboats. In the other, a ship collided with an iceberg and sank. Hmm, I don't know. I mean, I'll give you that it seems a little weird, but... I'm pretty sure it wasn't too uncommon for ships to hit icebergs back in the day, or even other ships. Right, I knew you'd say that. Hmm? But, what if Stead had some sort of special powers? To be more specific, what if he had the ability to do automatic writing? What? Uh, automatic writing? Wait, are you... Are you talking about when someone's possessed by a spirit and then they, they write a bunch of stuff without knowing what they're writing? Yes. What do you mean, yes? That stuff's a load of bull. Okay, let's say, hypothetically, that automatic writing isn't a total load. These guys still couldn't have predicted the sinking of the Titanic. When this Stead dude wrote his thing, nobody had died on the Titanic yet. So if automatic writing is about being possessed by dead people, who the hell possessed him so he could write that stuff? That's not it. What's not it? Stead wasn't possessed by a spirit. He was doing the possessing. Oh. Hmm. What are you smoking? William Thomas Stead was a passenger on the Titanic. He just wrote down what he saw with his own eyes 20 years before it happened. Um, well, uh, what's that? <laughs> what do you think when you hear the word experiment? Uh, 
What? Oh. I guess it was just a coincidence then. I mean, that you knew about the Four Leaf Clover. Uh, look, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I don't want to be a jerk, but you are making less than no sense right now. Oh, no, no, no. It's nothing. Just forget about it. Oh, don't, don't give me that. Uh, you really think I could just drop this? What is this experiment you were talking about? You promise you won't tell anyone? Cross my heart. Really? Really. I can trust you, right? Of course you can. Okay then, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what happened on this ship nine years ago. Wait, wait, wait. On this ship? Yeah, this ship. It was an experiment to test some sort of psychic thing. Communicating through these fields that you can't see. Fields that you can't see? Like, think about this. This is John, right? But... Is he really John? Huh? Isn't this like Locke's socks? Or the ship of Theseus? Um... You don't know? You haven't heard of those paradoxes? No? Really? Okay, well pay attention then. This is how Locke's socks works. Let's say I've got a pair of socks. They're my favorite socks. One of them gets a hole in it. What would you do if that was your sock, Junpei? Well, I, I guess I'd patch it up. Get some cloth and close up the hole. But what if another hole opens? I'd add another patch, I suppose. What if another hole opened after that? Um, another patch, I guess? Well, let's say you just keep adding new patches. Until eventually, the original cloth of the sock is totally gone. Once you get to that point, can you really say they're the same socks you started with? Hmm. Uh, well, that... Hmm, that's... Oh, that, that's tough. So, that's the lock socks thing? Yeah. The ship of Theseus is a lot like it. The ship of Theseus. If you keep fixing the damaged parts of a ship... Eventually, it ends up with none of the parts it started with. Can you really say that ship is the same one you started with? And what if you took all the old parts from the first ship and built another one somewhere else? Then which ship is the real ship of Theseus? The one you repaired, or the one you built with all the original parts? Hmm. Hey, do you think it's the same? What's the same? These guys. Is this John, or is it Lucy now? Uh, John's head and heart are both his. But apart from those, and a single arm, the rest of his body was once Lucy's. We're just like these mannequins. Think about it. The cells in our body change every day. Old ones die and new ones are born. Maybe part of my arm is made of stuff from a fish I ate once. Or maybe part of your right side is made from a cow you ate. If you take it a little further, 
Those cows and fishes are made from something else too, right? That's how we're all connected. Through fields that can't be seen with the naked eye. Who calculated one plus one? The, uh, the, the main computer, right? You said it connected to the monitor wirelessly. Yeah, but someone who grew up in a cave wouldn't know that, right? They'd probably think that this thing here, the monitor, is doing the calculating. And once they've decided that, they'll start examining this monitor. They might poke the screen or something. Ah, I see the color changes when I press it here. Then they might investigate the hardware on the inside. Oh, I see. So this wire supplies the power. Eventually, they might even cut the wires. Ah, yes. Just as I expected. When this wire is cut, no results appear. Therefore, it must be this device which does the calculations. Wow. But the truth is that, just like you said, the computer is doing the calculating. But these cave people wouldn't know that. Because they have no idea that the monitor and the computer are connected wirelessly. So, uh, what are you trying to say? Nothing, really. It's just, I thought, maybe. What if the relationship between human beings and our brains is like that? Huh? Well, let's say you stick a bunch of electrodes into parts of the brain. A scientist examining the signals they send out might say, Hmm, interesting. So stimulating this part of the brain causes the person to see colors. That must mean this neuron cluster controls that function. Let's see what happens when I cut out this part. Ah, just what I thought. Cutting off this part causes that function to cease. Therefore, human thought processes must occur in the human brain. See? Doesn't it sound the same? Mmm, uh... Maybe the brain is just an output device, like this monitor. Maybe our thought processes actually occur somewhere else, in a main body. We just don't know it. We never even think about it. Just like those cave people wouldn't know about wireless communications. We can't imagine that there's some unknown medium that transfers information into our brains, where we experience that information as thoughts. Um, the brain is just an output device. Human thought actually occurs somewhere else. <laughs> that's just crazy talk. Maybe that's the cause of Seven's amnesia. If memory is actually stored somewhere else, in some sort of main body somewhere, maybe he hasn't forgotten anything at all. He's just having a difficult time accessing his memories because the monitor, his brain, has been damaged. Huh. I suppose that would explain aphasia and blindsight, too. Perhaps they actually can speak or see. The monitor just isn't functioning properly. Hmm. I guess people with prosopagnosia could be suffering from the same thing. Wait a minute. Prosopag... what? What? You've never heard of prosopagnosia? No. What is it? Well, put simply, 
It means a condition where the mind can't distinguish between human faces. In other words, my face would look the same as Clover's or even yours. So they can't remember faces, which is how most people recognize each other. That means that people with prosopagnosia have trouble recognizing even people they're close to. Usually they can make do by associating people with other things, their voices, their clothes, their hair. Does that mean other people's faces look like uh, blanks? No, no, I don't think so. Well, you've seen monkeys, like in a zoo, right? To you and me, all the monkey faces look the same. Even though they've obviously got faces, it's almost impossible for a human to distinguish between them. The zoo staff that works with them would learn to identify different monkeys eventually. But you or I couldn't, unless one had a scar or something else to set it apart. Well, that's how people would be to someone with prosopagnosia. Prosopagnosia? Huh. I didn't even know that kind of thing existed. The only people who should and know about that are the other subjects. Subjects. The other people who were in the experiment nine years ago, with my brother and me. Uh -huh. But he's blind. And I was part of the Nevada test group. So neither of us would be able to recognize the faces of the people who were on this boat. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, time out. Let's just calm down for a second, okay? Start from the top. Don't start with the end and then jump to the middle. You, you, you gotta start with one and then move to two and three and four and so on. If you don't tell me stuff in the right order, I'm never gonna be able to figure it out. Okay. All right. Let's start with this experiment. What happened on this boat nine years ago? Do you know about morphogenetic fields? Morphogenetic fields? All right, how about, how about this? this? Theory, Theory of the, of the telepathic, telepathic mechanism. mechanism. I think Lotus mentioned something like that. Hmm, telepathy, huh? Well, that's not really it, but I suppose it's similar. So they were testing telepathy on this ship? Yeah, I guess so. So, what exactly did they have you guys do? The same thing that we're doing now. Exactly the same thing. What? The Nonary Game. Nine people were put on this boat, and nine others were put in the building in Nevada, and the game started. Look, I'm sorry, but I, I don't get it. What do the Nonary game and some telepathy experiment have to do with each other? Am I missing something here? The ability to access a morphogenetic field is affected by a couple of things. The first is epiphany, and the other is danger. You know how sometimes when you're up against a really tough problem, and then the answer just kind of pops in your head? That's an epiphany. And what you learn from the epiphany can be transmitted with telepathy. When you add danger to that equation, then it gets easier to transmit that information over telepathy. So you're saying the nonary game was supposed to introduce that element of danger? Yeah, but... 
couldn't be just any old danger. It had to be life and death. It had to be life and death. And... And... Someone did... Actually die. A girl. Huh. She was on the boat with my brother. I was in Nevada. I never met her, but... I did hear her name. Um. Her name was... You know, speaking of experiments... There was this experiment some scientists did with rats. First, they took a squarish C-shaped tank and filled it with enough water that the rats could drown in it. The tank has two exits. Just to make it easy, we'll call one A and the other B. Exit A is pitch black, so dark even a rat can't see anything. But exit B is electrified, which means the rat can't leave through it. So, what would a rat do if it was put in this situation? Which exit would the rat choose? B, of course. The rat has no way of knowing that exit B is electrified. Exactly. The rat goes to exit B. Of course, like I said, it's electrified. Which means the rat can't get out that way. So, after a lot of trial and error, the rat finally finds exit A. Hmm. I can't say that's very interesting or relevant. It's simply the story of a laboratory experiment. You're right. It isn't very interesting. Yet. Hmm? See, these scientists repeated this experiment over and over using hundreds of different rats over several generations. This produced some surprising results. With each generation, the rats took less time to find the correct exit. Eventually, a rat was put in the tank who instantly chose exit A without even attempting to go to exit B. But that wasn't the most impressive part. The same experiment was conducted in another laboratory, far from the original one, with the same results. No, on second thought, the results weren't really the same. The rats in this second experiment began the trials with significantly faster times than the first rats in the initial one. These rats weren't related to the others and had never even come in contact with them. And yet, they all easily found their way to exit A as though they already knew. What did it mean? Are you suggesting something like telepathy? They were passing information to one another through some undetectable medium? How the hell would I know? I'm not any kind of scientist. I don't know what made him do that. But I do know that story's true. And if you've got another explanation, I'd sure love to hear it. Hmm. Come on, let's get going. There's still a lot here we haven't checked out. And we gotta get the hell out of here before June passes out. Hey, wait. There's something I want to ask you. What? Why did they use that tank for the experiment? Huh? Well, I mean, it seems like you could conduct the same experiment without the water.
They could have just used a dry box, you know? If they needed to motivate the rats to escape, they could have... I don't know. Put some bait by exit B or, or something. I mean, do they really have to make it so the rats can drown? You know, the word emergency comes from the same root as the word emerge. You ever think about that? Huh? Well, an emergency is something urgent, often something dangerous. And to emerge means to sort of come out, or appear, or rise out of something else. So what's going to emerge in an emergency? Inspiration. Inspiration? Yeah. Think about it. When the chips are down, either you crack or your mind focuses and pulls up what you need. So in an emergency, your real potential emerges. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. That's why the rats had to drown. They had to be in danger. There had to be an emergency for inspiration to emerge. Oh. What's the passcode? What am I supposed to do? How can we figure it out? I need something. What the hell was that? That voice? Huh? What? What's up? Huh? Oh, um, <clears throat> uh, nothing. One, four, three, eight, three, four, two, one. Huh? Huh? Hey, what the hell were those numbers? Oh my gosh, are those? Huh. One, four, three, eight, three, four, two, one. One, four, three, eight, three, four, two, one. Oh, no way! What? Why are you... And I have no idea how I got the passcode for the coffin, either. Truth had gone, truth had gone, and truth had gone. Where did those words come from? Why did I feel compelled to push the buttons on the bracelet after hearing them? All I know is my fingers moved on their own. It was like I did it subconsciously. I don't get it. What the hell does any of it mean? Also, Snake and Clover have been subjects in a similar experiment nine years ago. The ability to access a morphogenetic field is affected by a couple of things. The first is epiphany, and the other is danger. And... and... Someone did actually die. A girl. 
her name was. There had been another experiment conducted on this same ship nine years ago, and a girl had died during it. Morphogenetic field theory. The two murders. Switching clothes. The nonary game. Huh. Zero. He's the ringleader. The person who trapped nine of us on this sinking ship. Zero should know everything. If we can uncover Zero's identity, all of our questions will be answered. Sheldrake 5? I think I saw the rest of this collection somewhere. Yeah, I think it was somewhere around here. Let's go take a look. Okay. Sheldrake, hmm. Have you heard of him? Sheldrake, I mean. Yeah, Lotus told me about him. There's a There's British, British biochemist bio named Sheldrake. Sheldrake. He has, he a, has rather a rather interesting, interesting theory. theory. Morphogenetic Morpho fields, fields, which, which relies, relies on the theory, on the theory of, of morphic, morphic resonance. resonance. Really? From Lotus, huh? Well, Clover also said something to me about that stuff. She did? Yeah, um, what was it? The ability to access a morphogenetic field is affected by a couple of things. The first is epiphany, and the other is danger. <sighs> that girl. I told her not to tell anyone. You did? Why? Well... Look, man, I didn't push it because we're in a hurry, but I'm kind of sick of this. How about you just tell me, okay? Tell you what? Don't give me that. About the experiment. Ugh. Very well, fine. I'll tell you everything. But not here. Let's move to the top floor. I suppose I might as well start by telling you why I kept quiet, and why I made sure Clover did as well. To be honest, the explanation is quite simple. Zero told me not to. I had little choice. He didn't walk up and tell me, of course. He gave me a message engraved on a card. That's... a braille card. It looks just like the one you showed us earlier. So you had two cards. No. Only one. Huh? What do you mean? I thought that card just had some rules for the nonary game on it. Yes, it did. And those were the rules I read you. However... They were not the only thing on the card. There was something I didn't read. Well, perhaps I should say... There was something I couldn't read. And that was? Tell no one of the events that took place nine years ago. Tell, and I activate your sister's detonator. It's a threat on our lives. Oh, 
Well, um... Well, what about Clover? Did she get a message from Zero Two? I don't believe she did. But doesn't it strike you as strange that Zero would shut my mouth, but not hers? Yeah. To be on the safe side, however, I told her it was best not to tell anyone. Still, apparently she told you. That girl. What's wrong with her telling me? I figured some stuff out with the thing she told me. Hmm. I mean, it looks like the whole activate her detonator thing was just a bluff. She's prancing around downstairs happy as a clam now that you're back. That's very true. I've decided I can trust you. I've decided to tell you the truth. The chance that Santa is zero is very high. I feel I can assume Santa doesn't have the time to observe us at the moment. And at any rate, even if he were, I very much doubt he would kill us. Why? Clover told me about the four-leaf clover, about the words. If he knew about that, then he was in my group during the first experiment. I'm sure of it. He wouldn't kill us. No matter what the situation was. <sighs> hey, uh, Snake? Yes, I know. You want to know what happened during the experiment? Yeah. How much do you know? Clover told me about... I see. The morphogenetic field in the experiments nine years prior. How the experiments had taken place simultaneously at two locations, one being the ship and the other being a building in Nevada. And the girl that died during the experiment. She told you all that, did she? Hmm. At any rate, I now know how much you've learned. All that remains for us to determine... ...is who did this and why, right? Yes. Can you tell me what happened? Yes. The people who organized the initial experiment were from a company called Cradle Pharmaceuticals. There were four of them running the show. Gentaro Hongo, Nagisa Nijisaki, Teruaki Kubota, Kagechika Musashido. Hongo was the CEO of Cradle Pharmaceuticals. Nijisaki was his right-hand man and did the lion's share of the planning. Kubota led the company's research and development division. Musashido was their majority stockholder. It was these four people who planned the initial experiment. Hmm, let me simplify it for you. Hongo designed it, and Nijisaki put it all together. Kubota developed the technology required, and Musashido provided the cash. Huh, so it's Hongo, Nijisaki, Kubota, Musashido... Of course, more than four people were required to conduct an experiment of this scale. To that end, they organized a top-secret team to assist them with their research. All in all, they gathered ten people or so. Those ten completed their team, and they were able to begin the project. They named it the Nonary Project. The purpose of the experiment was to research the prospect of controlling a human mind through sheer will. The uh, vessel, I suppose you could say 
for this control was the morphogenetic field. Huh. Why did the glycerin suddenly begin to crystallize? Why did the crystal structure of EDT undergo a sudden change? Why did the rats improve their puzzle-solving skills with each generation? Experiments with humans produce the same results. The more people who knew the answer to a question, the more there were who could answer correctly without having seen the problem before. Why is that? How could it happen? Hmm. The answer is that the shape of the answer has been stored in a field invisible to the naked eye. And through that field, the resonant event transmits information related to that answer. That's essentially the idea behind morphogenetic fields. But that's just a theory. Can't bring yourself to believe it? Yeah, um... Let's say someone killed another person because the devil told them to do it. Whether the devil exists or not has no relevance to the murder. They believe the devil exists. Whether or not he does is immaterial. So what matters here is that Hongo believed in the morphogenetic field. That's right. But I still don't get it. You said they wanted to figure out how to control people. Right? That is what you were saying. Yes. So how are they going to do that with a morphogenetic field? I'll keep it simple. Let's suppose 10,000 people have solved a certain problem. The chance of you knowing that answer, even if no one has told you, will go up. Let's have another example, shall we? Say, one million people were to do a handstand right now. Tomorrow, the chances of you doing a handstand would be higher, even if you had heard nothing of this hypothetical mass handstanding. Mankind's thought process and actions are all part of a resonant event. All of the resonant events encoded in the fields are projected onto you. Of course, this assumes you believe in this theory. Do you follow so far? Yeah. Now, if there was a person who had the same effect as those millions of people, what would happen? If that one person were to do a handstand, other people would find themselves wanting to do handstands as well. Can you imagine what a person with powers like that would be able to do? Come on, there's no way. I'm not done. Imagine another scenario. Imagine another person. This is an ordinary person. Let's say he does a handstand. What if there was someone who could grab the resonant event he created by doing that and use it to make other people do handstands? What would happen then? Mm. A person who has the power to write to the field and someone who can read from the same. You could think of them as the writer and the reader or the transmitter and the receiver. What would the world be like if there were people with abilities like these? So the transmitter's resonant event can be transmitted through the field and sent to the receiver. And then the transmitter can control the receiver however they wish. That's what you're saying, right? Yes. 
Close enough, at least. Come on, that's just crazy. Well, if you want to prove that, then you'll have to test it first. At least, that was how they thought. That was why they decided to do their experiment. That was how the Nonary Project began. By the way, Junpei, have you ever heard of the Gansfeld experiment? Yeah, that was an experiment in telepathy, right? You place a pair of subjects in separate rooms. Then you show one a picture and ask the other what they see. Interesting. I'm impressed. Yes, that is exactly correct. So, why did you bring up the Gansfeld experiment? It was used to screen subjects for the Nonary Project. The hospital in a remote town was affiliated with Cradle Pharmaceuticals. Hongo used it to conduct experiments on visiting children in secret. Some of them, he found, had potential. He began to gather children that showed promise. Children that seemed as though they might be able to access the field. Of course, none of them volunteered. They were kidnapped. There were nine pairs of siblings taken, for 18 children total. For reasons that were not fully understood at the time, each pair had one transmitter and one receiver. They were split perfectly. As such, the 18 children were split into two groups of nine. The children who were put into group Q were the ones who excelled at transmitting. They were transferred to the mock experiment building known as Building Q in the Nevada desert. The children who excelled at receiving were put in Group A. Group A was then placed on the former hospital ship Gigantic. From the experiments he had conducted so far, Hongo had learned the following. There are two things that can increase one's resonance with the fields. The first is epiphany. The other is danger. Have you ever been faced with an especially difficult problem and thought about it very long and very hard until finally an answer suddenly appeared in your mind? It may seem obvious to say so, but that is what is meant by epiphany. The information obtained through that epiphany can be easily transmitted through the fields, where it can be easily interpreted. Adding danger to that equation allows for even easier field access. That's where Hongo came in. They set up a number of puzzles across the gigantic. The participants had to solve each one before they could move to the next room. Of course, he hadn't forgotten to include danger. He had detonated a bomb on the hull of the Gigantic. The children in Group A were forced to play the nonary game as the ship sunk. By forcing the children into a life-or-death situation, Hongo hoped to increase the likelihood of their tapping into the fields. The children from Group Q, on the other hand, were confined to the mock experiment building, Building Q. Building Q duplicated the interior and puzzles of the gigantic exactly. Every detail was exactly the same. Hongo explained the situation to the children in Group Q. Solve the puzzles you find throughout the rooms. When you have the answers, transmit that information to the children in Group A. 
If you succeed, they will be able to solve the puzzles and escape. But if you fail, then the Gigantic will sink and your brothers and sisters will drown. Those were his orders. Do you know why the astronauts of Apollo 13 were able to return to Earth safely? It was because NASA had access to a replica of the Apollo 13 capsule. All of the equipment, the instruments, everything, all of it identical. Everything was just like the real Apollo 13. NASA was able to replicate the situation the astronauts found themselves in. By putting themselves in the same situation, they attempted to solve the problems the astronauts were dealing with. Once they found solutions, they reported their findings to the men aboard the actual capsule. That was how they were able to return safely. It was the same with the gigantic in Building Q. The children from Group Q had to use the power of Epiphany to solve the puzzles they found and transmit what they learned through the fields. The children in Group A, however, they had to access the fields to learn how they might advance to the next stage. That is the simplest explanation I can manage. Huh. Hey, Junpei, Snake! How much longer are you two gonna sit around on those bony asses? Get down here already! He's right. Let's go, shall we? We don't have much time. We need to get out of here and soon. Hold it. There's one more thing I want to ask you. Hmm? Are you sure that there were 18 kids? Why? Well, I thought it was only 16. Oh, yes. That was what they said on the news, wasn't it? Yes, I have no doubt that 18 children were abducted and used in Hongo's experiment. After all, you couldn't exactly play a nonary game with any less, could you? Well, yeah, but are you saying that the news got it wrong? Yes, I am. There were two more children. However, they had no relatives that I'm aware of. I imagine no one filed a police report when they went missing. They were brother and sister, like Clover and I. The brother's name was Aoi. The sister's name was... Her name was... <laughs> Her name was Akane. That was the girl who... died. Wait. Akane Kurashiki died? Nine years ago? Then... Who is June? No. No, 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 no. That, that's impossible. It can't be true. Akane isn't that uncommon of a name. If Snake had known her last name, that's a different matter entirely. So they share a name. A lot of other people do too. It doesn't mean anything. It was someone else. Of course it was. It has to be. <laughs> Is something wrong, Junpei? Your breathing sounds strange. Oh, uh, no, it's, it's nothing. I'm fine. Let's get back down there, all right? <sighs> I couldn't do it. Why didn't I ask? What's her last name? I just couldn't get the words to come out.
a picture. What the? What the hell is this? This man with a mustache on the right. He's the same guy we found murdered in the captain's quarters. He had the zero bracelet on his left arm. And the second man with the glasses and a doctor's coat. He's the ninth man, the one with bracelet number nine. He died after he went into door five. But this guy, the one in the striped suit. Oh man, that's Ace. Yeah, I guess it is. No doubt about it. But what does it mean? What is Ace doing in this picture? Not only Ace, the ninth man and Cap, too. And they look happy, like they knew each other well. Why? How? How in the world are these four men connected? You say Ace is in that picture? Yeah, it doesn't look like it was taken recently, though. Ace, the Ninth Man, and Cap all look about ten years younger. Ah, so the Ninth Man and the man you found murdered in the Captain's quarters are also in the picture? Yeah. Is there anyone else? Or are there only three people in the picture? I'm afraid I can't see it. No, there's one more guy. He's got kind of long hair. He looks smart, but a little cold. He's the only one I don't recognize. Hmm. What's the date of the photograph? It doesn't have one. Did you look on the back? The back? Yes, the reverse. The other side. Huh. Praying for the success of the Nonary Project. With Nijisaki, Kubota, and Musashido. Huh. Then the four men in this picture were the organizers of the Nonary game nine years ago. That means Ace, the Ninth Man, and Cap were all responsible for making it happen. But... I feel like I should be more shocked about this. It's almost as if that's just how things were always supposed to be. Why? Why am I not surprised? Ace was the one in charge of the Nonary Project, but... Then why? Why am I so calm? It's like I already knew. You were there that day, weren't you? The tall kid in the jacket. That was you, wasn't it? Yes, it was. You are correct, Detective. Don't misunderstand me. I told you before how Zero threatened me. There was nothing I could do. I couldn't say anything about what happened nine years ago. So you're saying you're not working for Zero, right? Of course not. Clover, what about you? Hey, come on! You really think I'm working with Zero? I told you before, you idiot! I was in Nevada, in Building Q. I did hear that a detective rescued the kids on the boat, but... I didn't know it was you! <laughs> well, I guess I believe you. Alright, let me ask you another question. Santa's real name is Aoi Kuroshiki. He's Akane's brother. 
You know that? No! No, I didn't, did you? Well, yes. I know Aoi Kurashiki was her brother. But I didn't know he was Santa. At least not from the beginning. Nine years ago, he was in the middle of puberty. His voice is entirely different now. I'm ashamed to say that even my exceptional hearing wasn't able to make that connection. As such, I had no reason to think Santa was Aoi. When did you figure it out? Clover told me that Santa might have been one of the subjects of the initial experiment. It was only a short while ago, while we were leaving the library. When she told me that, I had a... feeling. Santa is Aoi? Akane Kurashiki, June's brother? There's still a lot we don't know. I mean, like, a lot, a lot. But there is one thing I think we can say we know. What's that? The body we found in the shower room. It had to be Nijisaki, dressed up to look like Snake. What? Come on, man, what kind of detective are you? You didn't figure that out already? Hey, go easy on me, man. I just got my memory back, all right? Got me some slack. Hmm. Well, if he is, the three murders make sense then, don't they? Yeah, that's right. Murder. Kubota blew himself up, but that was murder too. So why did these murders take place? If Junpei is correct, and the body in the shower room was Nijisaki's, that means all of the people who were murdered were involved with the creation of the Nonary Project. Kubota, the person who conducted the actual experiments. Nijisaki, Hongo's assistant. Musashido, the man who financed the project. You mean this was all just revenge? Santa is zero. He's getting revenge for the death of his sister. That's why he killed them. No, I, I don't think Santa actually murdered anyone. If I'm right, then it's not hard to figure out who the next victim's gonna be, is it? I'm pretty sure I don't have to tell you. Yes. Yep. Right. The next target will be Gintaro Hongo. The person who planned the Nonary Project. In other words, Ace. What? It says incinerator. So this is the incinerator. This is the first time I've seen it from this side, but yeah, I think so. Then there ought to be a lever near the door. Yeah, right here. Pull that and the door should open. Got it. Let's go. What the hell is going on? What's wrong? Are you okay? Jumpy, you came to get me. Of course I did. I made a promise. I'm so glad you're here. So glad. Hey. What happened to you? I'm fine. I just fainted. I wasn't feeling very good. I'm feeling a lot better now, though. 
Are you sure? Yes. I just need to rest a little longer. I'm... I'm sure I'll be fine. You shouldn't worry about me. Santa. Hey, where is it? Where's the gun? You hide it somewhere? I don't have it. I got sucker punched and they took the gun. What? Who took it? What? Isn't that obvious? I took the gun. Ace. <laughs> Just what the hell do you think you're doing, Ace? Or maybe I ought to say Gintaru Hongo, CEO of Cradle Pharmaceuticals. You have me at a disadvantage, and I don't like that. You know me, but I don't know you. Do you have any idea how much I've suffered? Can you even begin to understand my pain? The pain of prosopagnosia, right? Hmm. Another irritating insect. And how do you know that, hmm? Good question. No matter. If you don't want to answer, it makes no difference to me. This is a waste of time, anyway. It's time for me to go. First is one. Give me your hand. Ah! Eight. And with this... Nine. The Ninth Man. Kubota's bracelet. I believe I've won this game. I've had quite a time playing with you. I must thank Zero, I suppose. Wait, what? Ace doesn't know who Zero is. <laughs> what the hell are you planning, Santa? At any rate, this game ends now. I will escape, and the rest of you will have a slightly less pleasant ending. I suggest you enjoy your final moments. Goodbye. Now! No! Oh. Uh, oh, that was close. Too close. Thank you, Seven. Don't mention it. Just one punch ain't enough of this piece of shit. After what he did nine years ago, I ought to rip him to pieces. But if a suspect can't talk, they ain't much good. Once he's locked up in a cell, we're gonna have a little chat. Nine years ago? Uh, then you must be... Yeah, you finally figured it out, dumbass. Oh. <sighs> Ace, you killed Kubota, Nijisaki, and Musashido, didn't you? Ace, y you figured it out, haven't you? You were being manipulated. Yes, so it would seem. I was little more than a puppet, in many ways. Everywhere I went, Everything was already prepared. The Reds in the large hospital room were dismantled. Nijisaki was dressed like Snake. There was an axe in the captain's quarters. Musashido was delirious from the anesthetic, so he couldn't fight back. <sighs> Nijisaki as well. In retrospect, I can't understand how I could have fallen into such a simple trap. But yes, yes, this was a trap. It was Zero's trap, and I fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. I did everything he wanted me to do. Yeah, 
by manipulating you, Zero was able to kill three people and keep the blood off his own hands. All of this was revenge for what happened nine years ago. That's why this nonary game happened. Am I right, Santa? Huh? What the hell are you talking about? I don't know any... Ain't no point trying to play dumb anymore, Santa. Actually, I guess I should call you Aoi Kurashiki, huh? My memory came back to me, kid. You're Aoi Kurashiki, no doubt about it. Never thought I'd be back in this room talking to you. <sighs> but hey, I guess this was all part of your plan, right? After all, the person who planned the nonary game this time around was Zero. And Zero's you. <laughs> Looks like you really do have your memories back, huh? Well, I guess there's no point in hiding it then, huh? Yeah, you got me. I'm Aoi Kurishiki. I was one of the kids in the nonary game nine years ago. I made it out. So did Snake over there. But there's one thing... No, I, I guess there's two things you got wrong. Number one, I ain't zero. What? Wait, what? Sure, I was helping Zero out, but I'm really more of an assistant, like a secretary. But an assistant's only an assistant. I didn't come up with all this. All I did was follow Zero's orders. Then, if you're not Zero, who is? Calm down there, Junpei. <laughs> didn't I say two things? You made one more mistake. Junpei, you just said. All of this was revenge for what happened nine years ago. That's why this nonary game happened. But that's not it. Revenge isn't the only purpose. There's another reason you guys were playing the nonary game. <laughs> to save someone. Save someone? Right. You were brought here to help my sister. To save Akane. What the hell are you talking about? Akane Kurashiki died nine years ago in this room. I was there. I saw... Uh... What? What the hell? Where's... Where is she? Where's Akane Kurashiki? Oh, my head! Oh, my head, it feels like it's gonna pop! Seven! What the hell is going on? I don't know. I don't know, I just... Oh, I swear to God, my head feels like it's about to explode! What was the Nonary Project? I'm sure you know already, but I'll tell you one more time. It was a project designed to test a particular phenomenon. And what was that phenomenon? For two organisms to communicate with one another in the absence of physical contact. The morphogenetic field theory. Could human beings use these invisible fields to exchange information? That was what this experiment was conducted to determine. <sighs> there were two separate locations. One was the gigantic, and the other was a building in Nevada called Building Q. The nine children trapped in Building Q were faced with numerous puzzles, copies of identical ones in the gigantic, They were told to send their answers into the morphic field set and transmit them to their brothers and sisters on the gigantic. <sighs> the 
transmitters were put in building Q, and the receivers were put on the gigantic. Each sibling pair was supposed to be split up, but... But there was a mistake. Akane was a transmitter. She should have been in building Q. However, for some reason, she was placed on the gigantic with the receivers, like me. Perhaps she was mistaken for someone who was supposed to be in Group A. Whatever the case, Akane ended up on the gigantic. <sighs> I think I've told you enough. You get it, don't you? I'm pretty sure you know where this is going, Junpei. Where what is going? Don't play dumb. You know things you shouldn't. Things you couldn't. How did you know Ace had prosopagnosia? How did you know why Ace wanted to kill Kubota and how Nijisaki was killed? Were you surprised when you found out Ace was Hongo? And what about the coffin Snake was trapped in? How the hell did you open it? Well... That's... Freeze. Get up. Hey, what's your plan, Santa? What are you doing? Didn't I tell you? I'm Santa Claus. It's time for me to go make a wish come true. You were right. It ain't opening. 
but it did open nine years ago. The digital route was nine then, I'm sure of it. You think maybe they changed the settings? Perhaps. Come on, over here! Come on, hurry up! Hello? Everyone? Could you come over here for a moment? I have a little sister. She is very important to me. Right now, she is over in Building Q, and is desperately trying to send information over to me. Her name is Clover, and today is her ninth birthday. I was going to give these to her as a birthday present. I was outside picking them when I was abducted. I'm sure I've already told you, but I am blind. For a man who can't see, collecting nine of a very specific plant is... Well, it is difficult. But my sister means a great deal to me. And I hope that these would show her how much I cared for her. Since it's her ninth birthday, I thought nine four-leaf clovers would be appropriate. Every one of you has a brother or a sister in Building Q with Clover. For their sake, we have to survive. We have to get off this ship. Do you understand? If we're going to do that, there are three things you have to remember. We need trust and love, and we have to have faith in one another. If we can take all three of those to heart, then I promise that good luck will come our way. Did you know that the leaves on the four-leaf clover mean faith, trust, love, and luck? Those words are leaf words. So if you believe what I've told you, and you understand, then I want you each to have one of these. They're a promise between friends. Now don't ever forget, so long as you have that, we will always be connected. Do you understand?
gonna do? There aren't any other doors. Warning. Warning. Emergency incineration command has been acknowledged. Automatic incineration will take place in 18 minutes. Please evacuate the incinerator immediately. Repeat. Emergency incineration command has been acknowledged. What? What's happening? What did that thing say? That didn't sound good. I think it means this room is gonna burn. Burn! The plaque on the door says incinerator. And that voice said that the incineration is about to start. And incinerate means to burn. No! Help me! Don't worry, kids. I'm not your enemy. I'm one of the good guys. I'm a detective. I'm here to rescue you. Ah, how wonderful to see you decided to come back. Come with me. We must continue the experiment. I said, come with me. Stop! Let go of me! Let go! Stop struggling, goddammit! Do as I tell you! Help me! Somebody help me! Akane! You're too late, idiot!
Akane! Akane! Are you okay? Fungo. He went out the other door! W what? On it. On it. Emergency incineration command has been acknowledged. Incineration will begin in... 18 minutes. Please evacuate the incinerator immediately. I knew it! Uh, it's starting. Santa started the incinerator. Fuck! Man, I never thought I'd hear that damn voice again after nine years! What the hell? What the hell? What in God's name are you talking about? It's nine years this and nine years that, and when it's not nine years something, then you're talking about some sort of fucking experiments. You aren't making any sense. Uh <laughs> I'm sorry, Lotus, but we really don't have time to explain it right now. I promise, I'll tell you everything once we get out of here. But... Incineration will begin in... 17 minutes. You know what that means, right? Incinerate means burn! Uh, what kind of idiot do you think I am? I know what incinerate means. Well, god damn it. Okay, okay, fine. I won't ask anything else. Talk about whatever you want. But you have to do something for me. Seven, figure this out. What? Why me? Just shut up and stop this thing. How the hell? There has to be some sort of emergency shut off button. There isn't anything like that. How the hell do you know? Because I looked for it nine years ago. What the hell is that? <gasps> what is that? What is that? Incineration will begin in 15 minutes. Hey, move! Oh, 
Okay, it's turned on. There's nothing on the screen, though. Oh, this is bad. This is really bad. If there's nothing on here, how are we supposed to do anything with it? What is this? What's up? It looks like some sort of puzzle. Do you think that if we solve this puzzle... The incinerator will stop? Yeah. Well, we can hope, right? Incineration will begin in... 13 minutes. Hey, what are you doing? Ah, oh, don't know what to do. It's simple, really. But I suppose I might as well tell you. Just solve the puzzle on that machine. <laughs> You're a terrible person! I hate you! Oh my! How could you call a gentleman such as myself a terrible person? That's not very nice. I'm quite fair. I don't use tricks or play dirty. You see? I've even left you a way out. A way out? Didn't you hear me? All you have to do is solve that puzzle. Do that, and you can stop the incinerator. What's the point of stopping it? You'll only capture me and make me do this all again. I'm not going to listen to you. If you're just going to throw me back in here, I might as well just die now. My goodness, haven't you listened to anything I've said? I told you, I'm a fair man. Huh? If you solve the puzzle, the verification function of the red will in turn activate. If this experiment is to deliver valid results, there must be a chance of success. If you succeed, you will escape. The verification function of the red? Ah, so you do remember. Right now there are two numbers in the red. The first is one, and the second is three. Say, Akane, what's your number? You really aren't one for listening, are you? I've already told you, didn't I? Once you solve the puzzle, the verification function of the red will activate. In other words, if you haven't solved the puzzle, you can't enter your number. What kind of fool are you? Why? Why are you doing this? <laughs> you could never understand. You don't know what it's like to spend every day surrounded by monkeys. <laughs> now start the experiment. Solve the puzzle. Of course you don't! Isn't that the point? You understand, don't you? Access the morphogenetic field and find the solution! I can't! 
then you'll die. You'll burn alive. <laughs> it's going to be quite hot in there in a few minutes. I imagine it will be very painful. <laughs> <laughs> Incineration will begin in ten minutes. I can't! I just can't! There's no... Th there's no way! I can't figure this out! Akane? Akane? Who the hell is Akane? Shut up! Just shut the hell up! Akane! Akane! Can you hear me? Akane! Say something! Akane! Answer me! Akane! Jumpy! Akane! Jumpy! Akane! Akane! Right. There's only one way to help her. You were brought here to help my sister. To save Akane. Incineration will begin in... Seven minutes. Got it!
minutes. Jumpy! Yeah, I know. Just hang on, all right? I promise I'll get you out of there. I'm not gonna let you die. I promise. So don't worry, all right? Just give me a few minutes, okay? Okay. Trust me, okay? what I did all those times before. I'm gonna do this on my own, with my own mind. I'm gonna solve this problem. That's it! Akane! Did you get it? Yes, I did! I solved it! I mean, really, you solved it for me, but I copied everything you did! Now I just have to press enter! Then what the hell are you waiting for? Push it! Okay, I will! Emergency shutdown command has been confirmed. Incineration system has been disabled. Akane, sorry, but things are kind of busy over here. I'm gonna have to hang up now, okay? Oh, of course, that's fine! Now. Junpei, are you... Okay. 
Ah, shut it! Incineration will begin in... 90 seconds. It doesn't sound like it's stopping. <sighs> what the shit? Why isn't it stopping? Incineration will begin in 60 seconds. It is hidden, but an exit can be found. Seek a way out. Seek a door that... Incineration will begin in... 30 seconds. Run, guys! Get to the door! Run! Quick, verify your numbers on the red. Verify? Who? What combination? All of us, we all need to verify. Why? You really think this is a good time to ask questions? Just do it! Incineration will begin in... Ten seconds. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. Central gate has been opened. Incineration system has been disabled. We've only got nine seconds before the door closes. Go, go, go! Shit. <sighs> Looks like we made it, huh? <laughs> Akane? Akane! Can you hear me? Akane!
Akane! Get out of here. If we don't book it, we might run into Hongo again. Junpei, can I ask you something? What's up? That door, the one with the nine on it. Why did it open? Yeah, all five of us verified our numbers on the red. Two plus four plus five plus seven plus eight is 26. That makes our digital route eight. It shouldn't have opened. <laughs> That's not like you, Lotus. I thought you would have figured it out already. Why? Because you were the person who taught me about the idea of bases. M is 23, O is 24, P is 25. Yeah, and? What comes after that? Uh. Hmm. Uh. Oh. Q. 26! And what does that mean? That wasn't a nine on the door. It was a Q! A fucking lowercase q! Yep, that's pretty much it. I guess to put it another way... You could say that it was a 9 in base 10, but a q in base 27. All right, I'm gonna open it. Yeah. Yes. We're finally here! Please do!
Yeah. No way. What? It can't be. This is... This is the building in the Nevada desert. The mock experiment building. This whole time, we were in Building Q. Connie. Jumpy. Are you... okay? Oh, come on. Uh, this is nothing. Really? Yeah. You don't look okay. How does it look, then? Um, well, let's see. It looks like you kissed a toad and got warts, but then they just kept growing and growing and growing. <laughs> what does that even mean? Oh, ow, 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 ow. See? I told you you're not okay. You're too reckless. You can't beat five eighth graders, Jumpy. That's crazy. Yeah, but I couldn't just stand there. I mean, don't you think so? I had to do something. This is so fun! This is so awesome! Driving is so great when there's nothing around! And there's no speed limit! Hey, uh, Clover, watch those bumps, alright? This car jumps even a little, and I think I'm gonna get crushed to death. Hey, shut it! 
I can't help if I'm big, all right? Suck it up. Why don't you drive, Seven? I'm a cop. I ain't gonna break the law. He doesn't have an international license! Yeah, but you could have sat in the passenger seat. Oh, hell no. There's no way I'm giving this seat up. <clears throat> and Clover, there's no need to slow down. The car Santa and June are in should be somewhere down this road ahead of us. Yeah, I saw some fresh tire tracks going out. There's no doubt about it. Then we've got to hurry if we want to catch them, don't we? Sure thing! I, I guess I could have. Then why didn't you? I didn't want to. I wanted to beat him up. Beat him up real good. Because of what they were doing to the kitty. Yeah, that too, but I think they were the ones behind those murders our first semester. Remember? Oh, you mean the bunnies. Yeah, the bunnies. They asked me what elementary school I was from, so I told them. And then they said they'd do the same thing to you that they did to the rabbits. I couldn't forgive them for that, so I... Hey, uh, there's still some stuff I don't get. Like Ace. Well, I guess I should say Gintaro Hongo. Why did he create the Nonary Project? Anybody? Any ideas? Why don't you ask him yourself? He's still in the trunk, I assume? Listening to us? Come on, I know you were. Answer me. I, I only wanted to see the faces. Human faces. I thought. I thought, if I could gain the ability to access the Morphic Field Set, then perhaps I... could see faces. By peering into people's minds, you could understand how they were processing the expressions of others. That's it? Yes. If you want to put it simply. But if you are looking for a more philosophical answer, supply that as well. You see, the human collective consciousness... Alright, so what's your second question? 
you said there were some things you didn't get, didn't you? Well, my next question doesn't really have anything to do with you two. This is for you, Seven. It's about the whole Alice thing. What's the deal with that? Well, you see, nine years ago, after I escaped from the Gigantic, I kept going after Hongo on my own, hoping I'd catch him when he finally slipped up. And during the course of my investigations, I learned a lot more about the Gigantic. I also found out about Gordain and Alice. You're not really answering my question. Was there actually a girl who wouldn't melt at room temperature? doesn't exist. Nine years ago, I found Alice's coffin behind the library on the bottom deck. There was nothing in it but the root of a peculiar plant. My research determined that it was a member of the genus Madragora, of the family Solanaceae. I was able to extract a particular alkaloid from it. I used that extract to create Soparu. Its creation was a tremendous boon to my firm, and we grew rapidly. I'll never forget you either. 